All right, chapter 11 of the Black Pearl. So um, as we read in the last couple of chapters, uh, Ramon's father gave the pearl to the church. The church had a big celebration. Everyone got to come see it. Seviano kind of was looking around like, hey, that's the pearl you found, huh? It's pretty big. All right, good for you. So now we are heading into chapter 11. So please read, follow along with me. The fleet sailed that morning for Isla Seraldo. The boats glistened in their fresh paint and the streamers that hung from their masts still shone bright. They fluttered in a light wind that blew out of the south and the sky was the same color as the morning sea. It was a beautiful day, as if the Madonna herself had willed it so. When I left for home that afternoon, it was very hot because the south wind had died away. Then the cool Comorel, Coromel started to blow down from the mountains. But at supper, the Coromel died too, and the air was heavy and hard to breathe. Trailing clouds appeared in the sky, and the palms in the courtyard began to rustle. My mother stopped eating and went to the window and looked out. If my father was on the sea, the smallest change in the weather made her fearful. If the wind did not blow, she was fearful. If the wind did not blow or the sky was overcast or with mackerel clouds, or morning dawned without haze, she was fearful. It is a cormorel again, I said. The cormorel is cool, she answered. The wind in the palms is hot. It is hot because the night is hot, I said though I knew better. I knew that it was in this way that the Chubasco began, the most dreaded wind that blows on our Vermilion Sea. I will go outside and look, but I am sure that it is the Cormel. In the courtyard, I glanced at the sky. There were no stars and the wind had died once more. Yet I was aware that the wind that had rustled the palms was not a mountain wind. It had come from the Southwest, home the Chubasco for the air smelled strong of the sea. I went back to my supper and tried hard to be cheerful. The sky is clear, I said. I have never seen so many stars. It is a fine night on the sea. The palms rustle again, my mother said. The gentle sound filled the room for a time as we drank our chocolate. Then, as if the palm leaves had turned to iron, there came a sound of metal clashing against metal. I got up and stared, excuse me, I got up and started across the room to close the door. But before I had taken two steps, the door crashed shut. Candle flames moved back and forth. And then there, and then, uh, let's try that again. The candle flames moved back and forth and then were snuffed out by an unseen hand. I tried to relight the candles, but failed. For through the barred windows, the air was being sucked from the room in great size. The wind, my mother said. The Chubasco, my sister whispered. I went to the window and looked out. There were no stars, and the clashing of the palms could not be heard. The sound was lost in the voice of the wind that had become the screams of a thousand frightened gulls. The fleet had warning, I said. It is put in at Pichilinque, or one of the safe coves. There are many between here and Seralvo. My mother got up and tried to open the door. Help me, she cried. You could not go farther than the courtyard, I told her. Not that far. Even crawling on your hands and knees. The fleet is safe. Never fear. It has the best captain on the sea. And he has been through many chubascos. The screaming of the wind became so loud that we could not hear each other. We huddled around the table in the dark room and did not try to talk. The Indians came from the kitchen and sat on the floor beside us. Two of them had husbands with the fleet. At midnight, the wind still raged, but toward morning it slackened, and at dawn died away in gasps as a wounded beast dies. We all started for the harbor to be there when the fleet came home. In the courtyard, the palms were stripped of their leaves and the tiles from the roof lay scattered around. And when we reached the plaza, pieces of rooftop were lying there also. 
the morning was gray and hot. As we hurried down to the beach, many people joined us. Some of them had husbands or brothers with the fleet and all had friends. The beach was strewn with sea kelp and rows of dead fish and the boats that had been anchored in the harbor were piled high on the shore. Usually, before Jubasco, the boats were pulled out of the water and tied down. Here's a picture of the boats in the wind and the storm and the wave. And the boats were tied down with rocks. But the storm had struck so fast that this could not be done. Father Gallardo came running down to the beach shortly after we got there. His white hair stood on end, and he had his robe kilt, kilted up to his knees. Yet he spoke to us hopefully, telling us that the boats would soon be sailing in. The Madonna has watched over the fleet, he said, and it is safe. There are no coves here at hand, so it will be afternoon before the boats can reach the harbor. Go now to your homes with hope and with faith that our Madonna will and wait. But no one left the beach. The morning passed, and the afternoon wore on. And then at sunset, someone sighted a boat far out beyond the lizard's tongue. The boat came closer and rounded the lizard's tongue, and I saw that it was Soto Luzon in his red canoe. The old man pulled his canoe up the shore, far from the people who were gathered there, and sat down. I went over to him, and asked him if he had seen anything of the fleet. He rolled a corn husk cigarette and puffed on it for a time. I have not seen the fleet, he said, nor will I ever see it again, nor will you, senor. Anger came over me at these words. Do you say that the manta wrecked the fleet? No, senor, I do not say this. The storm wrecked the fleet, and you will never see it again. But you mean that the manta called up the storm? The old man did not answer. In anger, I walked away and left him and went back to where the people were gathered. At nightfall, he was still there on the sand, smoking his cigarettes and waiting. We built a fire out of driftwood, and all of us stood around it. The crowd grew larger, and some friends brought food and water down to us from the town. Father Gallardo came with a cross, which he placed upright in the sand as a symbol of our hope. My mother said to him, My husband gave the great pearl to the Madonna. Surely, Father, she will bring him home. Yes, surely, he said, for this is a wonderful gift. The night wore on, and many from the town drifted away. We kept the fire bright until dawn, hoping that it would help the fleet to find the harbor safely. Dawn broke clear and the sea lay quiet between the headlands and the peaks of the far off islands seemed to float in the sky, so close that you could reach out a hand and touch them. Soon after sunrise, a boy standing on the sea wall pointed to the south. I looked and saw a lone figure stumbling along the shore. At first I thought it was some drunken sailor who had strayed in front of the town. He was shirtless, and his face was covered with blood, and he would fall, lie for a moment, and get up. But as he came closer, there was something about him I remembered. I ran down to the shore. It was Gaspar Ruiz, the Seviano, and as I reached him, he fell at my feet. He raised himself and looked up at me. I have never seen the eyes of a living man that held in them so much terror. He opened his mouth, closed it, and then said, Lost. The fleet is lost. And fell back on the sand and began to mutter words that I could not hear. So why does all the talk about weather matter in this chapter? It starts off and Ramon's mother is so concerned about the wind and the, the temperature. Why all this concern about the weather? Because when you sail a boat on the ocean, 
and the weather changes, that's when it becomes dangerous. You're out there sailing your boat. It's nice and the sun's out and suddenly the wind comes up and you're trying to hold steering in your boat and the waves and the wind. <sighs> the weather can destroy a fleet of boats. Think about the mood, the feeling. But before I had taken two steps, the door crashed shut. The candle flames whoosh, got blown out. Oh, do you feel the wind? Do you feel the chill? Do you, did you feel the heat, but the wind and the sound? As the wind howls around your house and the palm trees. The mood, scary frightening, intense, mysterious, dark and unknown. <sighs> Howling winds. All right, Luzon comes and Luzon says, the storm wrecked the fleet and you will never see it again. And Ramon says, you think the Monte Diablo did this because I stole the pearl? The Monte Diablo sent the storm to kill my father. You think that, huh? Luzon says, no, the storm destroyed the fleet, but you will still never see the fleet again. And then Ramon says, but you mean the Manta called up the storm. The old man doesn't answer. So we use this word implication, where there's no real answer, no complete answer, but we can guess. He thinks the Monte Diablo did it. Luzon thinks the Monte Diablo created the storm because his pearl was stolen. So we as readers have to read the implication. We have to understand what's really going on here, what's really happening. All right, so what do you think, readers? Do you think that the Monte Diablo created the storm to destroy the fleet? Did the Monte Diablo destroy everything because he's angry about losing his pearl? Yes or no? It's for you to decide. That's the fun of reading. Because I don't know. I could see it that way. I could see it that way. Kind of interesting. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So very quickly, a summary here. Uh, Ramon's father goes out on the ship. The storm comes destroys everything, and only the Seviano survives. It's only the Seviano left. He's the only one who survived the from the ship. All right. And it's interesting because we know that Ramon, the Seviano, and the Monte Diablo fight to the death. All right. Getting pretty good. Getting pretty good. See you later.